Jacob uh, for sharing all those points. And uh, by the grace of God, we have been covering all those portions. And uh, uh, we already uh, discussed something about uh, the messages to the church at Ephesus. The messages to the church at Ephesus. Uh, it was from uh, uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 7. Chapter 2, verses 1 to uh, 7. So now, uh, I think uh, if you are getting ready, if somebody can read the portions, the Bible verses, then it will be uh, easy for me to I mean, uh, move forward maybe quickly. Okay, so uh, you can I mean, uh, get ready with uh, the Bible verses which I'm giving you. Then uh, if you are taking first, then you can read it. Okay, any one of, any one of you. Or uh, if, if somebody is taking first, you can read that. Okay, so that will be the uh, system today. So let us all I mean, uh, I mean, uh, go back to that point. You know, last week uh, we were discussing about uh, the church at Ephesus. Uh, that is the main heading was uh, uh, number C. It was uh, the messages to the church at Ephesus. So uh, already I told you that we'll be uh, discussing uh, mainly uh, two, three points from the uh, every churches. You know, every churches, when, when, when we are discussing about that church, uh, we, uh, all of a sudden we have to go to the uh, establishment of the church. That means, I mean, how the church was established in that city. And uh, something we'll be talking about the city also, and also we'll be going through the messages to the uh, each church. So now we are discussing about the first point, the appreciations. Okay, so that was the appreciation last week already. We discussed from uh, chapter two, uh, verses two, three, and six. Amen. So in appreciation, uh, the first uh, point was the uh, I know your deeds and your labor. I know your deeds and labor. That is already covered. Now we are coming to the second point. That is, I know your passions or perseverance. I know your passions or perseverance. That is in uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. It says like this. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot be, cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not. And you found them to be false. Okay. So now uh, we are thinking about, I mean, what God knows about the church, what God knows about the church at Ephesus. Amen. So the first point that, that God says that I know your deeds and your labor. And secondly, he says, I know your passions or perseverance. Amen. Now, when you think about that point, uh, you have to think about what was the situation of the Ephesus church in those days, in the time of Apostle John. It says that even in the midst of persecution and hardship, the church has stood firm in faith. The church has stood firm in faith. So Jesus is appreciating them for their patience. You know, the speciality of our God is God will be appreciating for our good work. Amen. And God is ready to appreciate for the good things that we are doing. The same thing is happening with the, the church at Ephesus. The God is appreciating those people because even though in the midst of the persecution and hardship, the church was standing firm in faith. So that's the reason that Jesus is appreciating that church uh, about their patience. That means, I mean, uh, we are supposed to hold on till the end. You know, the church was, I mean, holding on and we are supposed to hold on till the end and don't give up and uh, do not be fed up. When, uh, in Hebrews 10 verse 36, I think that is over. That, that, that point is already discussed, right? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 and 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. Is that, is that covered? No? Yes, it was covered. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. 
Uh, so that point is over, I think, you know, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 says that we need the patience to receive the fulfillment of God's promises. And 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4 verse 7, Paul says that I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Okay. That means the starting is not important, but the finishing is important. Okay. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7 says that, Paul says that I fought a good fight and I have finished my course and I have kept my faith. You know, uh, most of the time, the people are thinking about only uh, giving the importance for the starting or the beginning. But uh, uh, yeah, the, the beginning is not important, but the finishing point is the important thing. So that's the reason uh, 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 Jesus Christ is uh, appreciating this steps for knowing that I know your patience. You are holding fast and you are holding, I mean, the, the faith in Jesus Christ till the end. Okay, now. We will go to the uh, uh, next point that is in uh, the same verse, I mean, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, it says, I know that you cannot tolerate evil men. I know that you cannot tolerate evil men. That means they could not tolerate, the, the church at Ephesus, they could not tolerate and accept the evil people and the evil things. The evil people and the evil things. You know, uh, even uh, I told you already that uh, the city was full of evil and immoral things. I mean, the city of Ephesus was, I mean, uh, filled with the evil things and the immoral things. But this church always stood against all those practices. The church at Ephesus stood always against the practices of uh, evil people and the immoral activities. Amen. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, uh, it says uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, we will read that verse. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Very good. Okay. So it says that do not be bound together with unbelievers. Amen. So the church at Ephesus always was standing against the, the I mean, uh, uh, false practices and false teachings. Okay. So here it says that, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says that do not be bound together with unbelievers, with unbelievers. Again, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Amen. So it's a, it's a very important uh, uh, verse that, you know, it says that no one can serve two masters, right? No one can, I mean, serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise, I mean, uh, the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Okay, you cannot serve God and well. So when, when a person is serving God, he can serve, I mean, God only. I mean, otherwise he can serve the other gods and goddesses or wealth or something. Okay, so that is the meaning of it, you know. Uh, uh, Matthew, I mean, uh, 6 verse 24 says that no one can serve two masters. I mean, so uh, we have to understand one thing that, I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, other people are asking, is there any, any, any problem? that uh, if you are getting friendship with uh, the unbelievers, if we are having a friendship with unbelievers, okay? So there is no problem at all if you are getting a friendship with unbelievers. There is no problem at all. But be careful not to be, not to be I mean, bound together with them, amen? So that is what we read in these verses. I mean, most of the time, uh, some the, 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 the believers are just, I mean, having a friendship with the other I mean, people. That means the, 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 the unbelievers. Okay. At the same time, be careful that they not be bound together with them. Amen? Otherwise, we believers will uh, become like the unbelievers afterwards. Amen? So that is what, what is going to happen uh, in, our, in our life also. 
So it should not happen in our life. So let us be, I mean, very careful that whenever we are getting friendship with the, the unbelievers, let us, I mean, I mean, share the gospel to those people. And uh, that is the, that must be the motive of our uh, life when we are getting friendship with uh, the unbelievers. I mean, now we will go to the uh, 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 next point, next appreciation of uh, Jesus Christ towards the church at Ephesus. That is, I know that you disciplined against the false teachers. I know that you disciplined against the false teachers. Chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> I know that you disciplined against the false teachers. That means it says in, 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 in verse two that you have examined the claims of those who say that they are the apostles, but they are not. You have examined the claims of those who say that they are apostles, but they are not. That means you have found them, they are liars. You have found them that they are liars. That means they had a discerning spirit. They had a discerning spirit to recognize the false teachings. They had a discerning spirit to recognize the false teachings. You know, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, do you read that verse? 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, um, Apostle John says something like, okay, you can read that. 4 1. Right. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Amen. So do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because there are already many false prophets in the world. Amen? So this is very important to understand, you know, the church and the believers of the church must be able to, I mean, discern the spirits and they are supposed to identify what is the wrong and the right. And the church must be ready to and prepared enough to understand what is the wrong teaching. So here we understand, we read that, do not believe every spirit. There are many spirits and there are many teachers and there are many apostles. They are calling themselves as apostles and there are many pastors. They are calling as the pastors and there are many uh, prophets. They are calling themselves as the prophets. But it is our responsibility that we should have the discerning power. We should have the discerning power. That discerning power that the church at Ephesus, they were having. You know, we have to test the spirit to see whether they are from God. Because there are already many false prophets in the world. What is the reason that Apostle John is writing to, to the first century church? Why? Why? Because there were already, there were many false prophets in the world. So those when false prophets and false uh, apostles were trying to enter inside the church. So that's the reason, I mean, Apostle John is writing to those people that you must be very careful about all the spirits and the, all the apostles and uh, because they are calling themselves as apostles, but they are not the apostles of God. Okay, so again, in Matthew chapter uh, 7, verse 15, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 says that, beware of the false prophets. Okay, beware of the false prophets. Amen. Hallelujah. So some people, uh, uh, many times, you know, they used to say, uh, uh, what is that? Do not judge others. Okay. So um, I, I, I know that uh, there are some people, I mean, always saying, and we also used to say that, okay, do not judge others, right? Do not judge others. Okay, we are not supposed to judge other people. And God will judge those people and all those things. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, even in... Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 also. In Matthew chapter uh, 7 verse 1 it says that, 
Jesus is saying something that do not judge others so that you will not be judged. Do not judge others so that you will not be judged. Of course, this is the words of God. This is the word of God. But what we are doing when we are judging or when we are testing somebody, what we are doing? Actually, if we judge for identification, there is no problem. But do not judge for condemnation. This is very important. Okay? When you judge a man or when, when you judge a pastor, when you judge a prophet or when you judge an apostle or a leader or a believer, whoever it may be, there is no problem at all. If you are just testing them or judging them or thinking about them or just I mean, uh, inquiring something about them for identification, there is no problem. But it should not be for uh, a condemnation or uh, you know, it should not be a, a, a problem for that person that you know, if he is a man of God, then we have to accept him. And if he is speaking the real word of the, the truth of the word of God, then we have to accept that person. So we are doing the judgment, or we are, I mean, having the discerning power, not for the condemnation of that person, but we are just, uh, I mean, trying to identify that person whether he is coming from, uh, from God or not. Amen. So that is the appreciation that which I mean, Jesus Christ is giving for the church at Ephesus that, uh, I mean, you were, I mean, disciplined against the false teachers. You were disciplined against the false teachers. The next point, the next point is, I know you endured the persecution. I know you endured the persecution. I know you endured the persecution. That is in chapter 2, verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3. You know, the verses from book of Revelation, I will try to read. And the other verses, if you read, that will be easy for us to go forward. Okay, so chapter 2, verse 3 says like this. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Okay, so the Ephesus church had two kinds of struggles in, in their life, in, in, in the church. So one from outside and the other was from inside the church. Okay, mainly two struggles were there for the church at Ephesus. Okay, the one was from outside the church and the other one was from inside the church. I will explain what is that. The struggles from the false teachers and the persecutions from the Roman emperors. That is from outside. Okay, okay. The struggles from the false teachers, you know, some of the false teachers were trying to get inside the church and they were making some troubles inside the church. They were making some divisions among the believers and they were teaching the false teaching and believers were getting confused. So that was the one problem that happened inside the church. At the same time, the church was going through this severe persecution from the Roman emperors. The church was going through the severe persecution from the Roman emperors. But God is appreciating these people. God is appreciating the believers of the Ephesian church that even in the midst of the severe struggles and persecutions, both from the outside and the inside, for the sake of God, they have not grown weary. Hallelujah. So this is very important to understand. Even in the midst of the severe struggles, in the midst of the severe persecution from outside and the divisions and the problems from the inside, it was for the sake of God they were standing firm and they were endured the persecution. They were try they were they were I mean uh, uh, I mean bearing everything that they were having from inside and outside. So Jesus, even before his death and resurrection, told the disciples that you will be hated and by all because of my name. Amen. But one who has endured to the end will be saved. Amen. That's what we read in the Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. You read that verse. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Amen. What is that? You know, Jesus is saying that, I mean, even after, uh, even before his death also, already told 
already told. What is that? Disciples, that you will be hated by all, by all, because of my name, because of the name of Jesus. You will be hated from the all people, but one who has endured to the end will be saved. Okay, so what's the meaning of that word? I mean, till the end, that means end will be still. I mean, the person who is holding uh, the faith till the end will be saved. So that means when is the, the when is the completion of the salvation is happening? The completion of salvation happens only at the end of our life or at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the meaning of this verse. I mean, the, the completion of the salvation. Okay, you know, if, if we are not able to uh, hold fast that faith till the end, there is no chance to get eternal life. There is no chance to get eternal life. You know, some people will say that, okay, uh, I'm, I'm a saved person and uh, I'm a born again a believer and I'm a child of God. Then uh, now I'm a saved person. Okay, everything is perfect. Everything is done. But Bible says that if you are holding that faith till the end, if you're holding the faith till the end, till the end means till your death or till the second coming of Jesus Christ. But if you are not able to hold on the faith till the end, there is no chance to get the eternal life. The completion of the salvation will be happening in that point. I mean, even in Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 13, we are not going to read that verse. Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through I mean, 13, we read that, but one who endures to the end will be saved. Okay, one who endures to the end will be saved. So that is very important that, okay, do not think that, okay, I am a saved person, I am a born again person, I took the baptism in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and everything is over, and I will get eternal life, or I will, I will be getting inside the heaven. Do not think about that. But no one thing that, you know, if you are able to endure till the end, till the end of your death or till the end of your life or till the second coming of Jesus Christ, we will be saved. I mean, so let us work hard for that. I mean, I mean, in, 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 I don't remember that verse uh, uh, in, in somewhere it says in Bible, in, in, in the epistle, it says that, okay, you have to work hard for the salvation. You have to work hard for the salvation that is not talking about any good work or something but this is the this is the tolerance and this is the insurance that we are putting in the sight of god and that we are doing i mean we are working hard for the salvation that the holy life I mean, so that is the meaning of that then we will go to the next point of the appreciation that is i know that you hate the practices of nicolaitans I know that you hate the practices of Nicolaitans. Chapter 2, verse 6. Chapter 2, verse 6. Chapter 2, verse 6 says like this. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, which I also hate. God says to the efficient church that you are hating the things which even God also hate. Very important. The efficient church, they were hating the things which even God also was hating. You know, uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a special group of people. It is mentioned in this uh, verse 6. You know, uh, even in, in, the, in the Bible, uh, uh, nothing is uh, written about uh, this group of people. Okay. It is written that, you know, uh, Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans. Okay. Nicolaitans. You can, you can, in, in Malayalam, it is Nicolavia. Nicolavia. Okay. So, uh, uh, in Bible, uh, nowhere in Bible uh, I mentioned uh, what was the teachings and practices of Nicolaitans, but it is said in the history uh, something about uh, uh, that group. Okay, so we are going to look into that portion 
you know, uh, the, the, the Nico, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas was the founder uh, of his teachings. Okay, the history says that Nicholas was the founder of these teachings. But uh, at the same time, nothing is about, uh, uh, nothing is written in Bible about what was the teachings of this group. Okay, what was the teaching of this Nicholas? At the same time, there are some uh, important things that we have to get from history and also from the uh, biblical portion that we will uh, go through that. Okay, so, you know, uh, the, the Hebrew uh, name uh, uh, for Nicholas, Nicholas is Bala. Okay, the Hebrew name for Nicholas is Bala. Bala. Which means one who influenced the people in God's way. The meaning of the word Balaam is one who influenced the people in false way. That means through the false practices. Remember, Bala is the Hebrew word which is used for the Nicholas, which means one who influenced the people in a false way. That means this group of people and this man, I mean, uh, Nicholas was having a, a, a particular, uh, I mean, what is that, you know, uh, a, a system and he was uh, able to influence the people and make some, making some troubles uh, through, I mean, imparting the uh, uh, false teachings to the believers of the efficient church. Okay, so we will, uh, uh, we will, I mean, uh, uh, go through that portion, especially, you know, there are mainly uh, five views about the teachings of Nicolaitans. There are mainly five uh, views about the uh, teachings of uh, Nicolaitans. We will go through that one by one. Okay, so I told you once that uh, uh, these views are from the history, we are taking from the history. Uh, it is not uh, written in the Bible. At the same time, uh, the history, the historical people uh, and the scholars says that, I mean, uh, there are something uh, written in the history about uh, the Nicolaitans. Nicolet uh, there are five views. Okay, we will go to that views. Uh, the first view is uh, in Acts chapter six, we read uh, that uh, there were some problems between the Hebrew speaking and Greek speaking people. Okay, when you go to Acts chapter six, we understand, you know, uh, there were some problem happening uh, in uh, in the church at Ephesus that you know the Hebrew speaking people were there and Greek speaking people were there, especially in uh, uh, chapter six verse five. Read that verse. Read that verse. Acts six five. Acts six five. Acts six five. Acts six five. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man of a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, a Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Yeah. Okay. So in uh, Acts chapter six, verse five, we see that uh, they selected seven men with uh, good reputation and wisdom. I mean, good reputation and wisdom. And one among them was Nicholas. One among them was Nicholas. Okay, the history says that again, Nicholas is the person who is uh, who, who was the leader uh, and the founder of the uh, Nicolaitans uh, uh, teachings. Okay, now we read about the Nicholas in uh, Acts chapter six, verse five. That uh, I mean, among those seven men, he was the one person. Okay, one person. Then. Afterwards, what happened? This man became a black backslider and went away from the church and he started to teach a different doctrine. This is one view about this group. One view about this group outside the Bible. Okay. So, but there is there is one reference in Acts chapter 6, verse 5 about Nicholas. Okay. So anyway, you know, somebody says that okay, this Nicholas. I mean, he was the, one of the main person in the church at the same time afterwards. But after this man became a backslider because of many reasons and uh, he went away from the 
church and he started to teach a different doctrine uh, to the Ephesian church. That is the first view about this group. And the second view, second view is in the first century, church, there was no gap between the church leaders and the believers. Okay, so I'm, I'm coming to that point. But when we know that, you know, when you read uh, Acts chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 chapters, we understand what was the situation of the first century church. What was the situation of the first century church? Of course, there were leaders and there were ministers and there were apostles to lead the church. But at the same time, there was no gap between the church leaders and the believers. That means all of them were joined together and they were sitting together, maybe in a room or even they did not have any a church building or something. They were just sitting under the tree or inside the room of a house of a believer or somewhere else, okay? Not inside the church, okay? So those people, they're having a close relation with the leaders and believers, between leaders and believers, okay? But this group, in that situation, this group, the, the, the group of uh, the teachings, the, the group of Nicholas, you know, this group of people uh, introduced the clergy system and the laity system. The clergy system and the laity system. What is the, what is the meaning of the clergy system and the laity system? The clergy is the leader of the church or the minister of the church. You can call him as a pastor of the church or bishop of the church or priest of the church. Okay, the priest system and the laity system. The laity system means the common people, the common people, the believers. Okay, the, the believers, the, the common believers are known as the laity and the clergy is the main leader or the priest of that church. And these people said, we need the priest in Christian church also, just like the priest of the Jewish religion. You know, you know that uh, the, the, the Jewish religion was having a priestly system, priestly system, okay. So uh, they had the high priest and the priest and everything. So these people, this group of people were insisting the church believers that we should have the priestly system in our Christian church also. You know, that was the teaching of that. It was just like a Jewish religion. Okay, You can call it uh, in, in Malayalam, what is that? Okay, Thirumenium, uh, Imenium, uh, Imenium, Thirumenium, okay, two, two groups of people, okay. Uh, but the Ephesus Church did not promote that system. The Ephesus Church did not promote that system. You know, so they were always standing against that. They said, no, we all are one. There is no difference between the leader and the, or, or the clergy or the, or the laity. Okay, we all are all the same. We all are equal in the presence of God. At the same time, there are some leaders to lead us and there are some leaders to teach us the word of God. That is correct. But we are all sitting together. There is no gap between the priest and the believers. There is no gap between the priest or the pastor and the and the believers. So that is that is what we read. You know, uh, let us read the first quote in the chapter, chapter one, verse 24. First quote in the chapter one, verse 24. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. So uh, it, in that particular verse, it says, you know, uh, church ministers are appointed not to rule over the believers, but to work with them in every circumstances for their joy, right? Okay. What is the church leader? And what is the church minister? And who is the pastor? Who is the bishop? The duty and the responsibility of that person is not, they are not appointed to rule over the believers. I personally believe that I don't have that ruling authority over the believers. I'm not ruling over the believers, but as a pastor, as a leader of the church, I'm trying to be with all the believers in all the circumstances for your joy and your happiness. Amen. So that is my responsibility and that should be the responsibility of every leader, every minister, every pastor, every priest of a church. Amen? So there is no gap between the believers and the leaders, but we all are one in Christ and we all are joining together and working for the expansion 
of the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, we will go to the third, uh, third view of the people about this group, Nicolaitans. Okay. So, the third view is, um, uh, I can tell you, uh, this was a group who tried to create divisions among the believers. Okay. This was the group they were trying to create a division among the believers. Okay. Division among the believers. Okay. Uh, through many, many reasons, through many reasons. We'll go, not go to those points. Now, the fourth uh, view, the fourth view is, this was a group taught that we are no longer under the law. That means the Old Testament people were, or the Jewish people in the, in the Old Testament time, they were under the law. Okay? Now, we are saved and we got the freedom. So we can do anything in our body. This was the teaching of that group. What is that? Now we are no longer under the law. Okay. The Old Testament people were having many laws and regulations and everything. But now we are, we got the freedom in Jesus Christ and we can do anything in our body and we have the freedom to do anything after the salvation. After the salvation. Okay. So that was the teaching of this group. Okay, and again, one of the, 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 the last uh, and the fifth uh, uh, view of uh, uh, some of the scholars is uh, uh, this group were following the idol worship and rituals. This group were, uh, uh, this group was following the idol worship and rituals. So that is the, these are the five main views of uh, the scholars. They are taking from the history. Okay, so whatever it may be, the church at Ephesus was always standing against all these false teachings and practices. Okay? The church at Ephesus always was standing against the false teachings and practices of these things. Okay? That is the reason that, I mean, Jesus Christ is appreciating this church. He is appreciating this church that you hate the practices of Nicolaitans because I also hate the false teachers and I also hate the false teaching and I also hate that the idol worship and pagan worship and rituals coming inside the church because in the first century church when I mean, the apostles were starting and founding the churches there was no other rituals like the like the I mean uh, what is that like the I mean uh, Gentiles okay so they all were trusting in God and they were teaching the real meaning of the word of God. That's what we understand from that point. Okay. So these are the appreciations that uh, Jesus Christ is giving to the church at Ephesus. Now we will go to the second main point. Second main point that is weak points and solutions. Weak points and solutions. Weak points and solutions. That means weak points about the church, church at Ephesus and also uh, the solution for the for their weakness. So that is from uh, uh, chapter two, verses four and five. Chapter two, verses four and five. But I have this against you that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds. You did it first. Or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. This is the verse. Okay. So uh, uh, this point I will not be uh, giving. So okay, I'll be giving a short explanation about this point because I may be uh, preaching uh, on one Sunday about uh, uh, these verses, maybe verses four and five. Okay, so that's the reason. Maybe you'll be, I mean, uh, you'll be getting a, a short explanation about this point. I'll be preaching someday uh, about uh, this point. Okay. Anyway, it is written there. You have left your first love. That is the weak point. Only one point is there. Only one weak point is there about the church at Ephesus. The other all points are speaking about the appreciations. God is appreciating them. 
At the same time, it says that you have left your first love. Amen. Even though God appreciating them for many things, he is revealing one weak point of the Ephesus church. Hallelujah. They were so, I mean, strong church in every way, a doctrinal way. I mean, they were very much enthusiastic about the gospel work and ministry and everything. At the same time, at the same time, I mean, I mean, God is saying that, okay, you left your first love. That means you lost your first love. So that is the only one mistake and that is the only one weakness that a weak point that they had. Even, you know, Apostle Paul have reminded them many times about the importance of the, the real love towards God and towards the brotherly. I mean, the, the core brother. Okay, even uh, when Apostle Paul was writing uh, the letter uh, to the church at Ephesus, okay, the Epistle of Ephesians, there are many references. I mean, uh, are written uh, in that slide. Maybe you can see that. Okay, that will be there. Ephesians chapter one, verse fifteen, three seventeen to nineteen, four one and two, four fifteen and sixteen, five two, uh, uh, six twenty three and twenty four. Okay, so these are the uh, verses that uh, Apostle Paul is, I mean, giving them and reminding them, you should keep your first love and you should have the, the love towards God and the brothers, the, the brother. Okay, so that is what uh, we understand from that point. And uh, that is the only one uh, uh, big point that God found about these people or the believers of the church at Ephesus. Now, we will uh, go to the, I mean, uh, threefold solutions for the I mean, weakness or of their, their serious problem. What is the, what was the, I mean, problem? They lost their first love. Now, God is giving the threefold solution for that serious issue. Threefold solution for this serious issue. That is in verse five. It says, therefore, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the deeds that you did first. I am coming to you and will remove your lampstands out of this place. Okay. So repent. Now, uh, there are threefold solutions for the serious problem that they were having. Okay. Or to get back to the first love. To get back to the first love. That means what to do. What to do to get back to the first love. Number one, remember. Remember. What to remember? From where you have fallen. From where you have fallen. Okay. That means find out what is the weak point or the mistake of your life? So, so the first solution is remember from where you have fallen. The second solution is repent. Second solution is repent. Repent from where? From the present situation of mistakes. Okay. So they had a mistake. They had a weak point. So you have to repent from the present situation. That is, the, that is the second solution for the people of Ephesus. Okay? And the third, third solution is repeat. Repeat. What to repeat? The first work you did in the initial stage. The first work that you did in the initial stage. The first work means they were so enthusiastic. They were so eagerly doing the work of God and they were having a real love towards the people and towards God but they lost it now the solution is you have to remember and you have to repent now you have to repeat the first work you did it in the initial stage praise God now we will go to the third main point that is warning warning that is in chapter 2 verse 5, and that is very important point. Warning to the church at Ephesus. In verse 5, it says that or else, second part of that verse 5, or else, I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. This is very important warning. Not only for the church at Ephesus, but for the eternal life church of God also. What is the warning? The warning is, I will come and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. 
you know, let me tell you one thing. When you read uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 20, chapter 1, verse 20, it says like this, As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. That means the church is the lampstand. Okay, the church is the lampstand and the church is placed to give the light to the world. The, the, the church is placed by God in this world to give the light for the world. But if the church is not faithfully doing its work, listen very carefully, if the church is not faithfully doing its work, God will remove it. <clears throat> That's, that's very clear words that it says that. You know, if the church is not faithfully doing that work, God will remove it and God will find some other people to do that work. Yeah. Then, you know, let me tell you one thing. You know, when, whenever we think about uh, the, our Christian churches all over the world, you know, many of the churches are going down in their spirituality. You know, Many of the churches are, I mean, literally they said, okay, we are the church of God and we are the church that God has planted us in this place and we are the local church and we are the Christian church and everything. But, you know, even the, even let me, um, forgive me if I say that word Pentecostal people, the Pentecostal people, you know, uh, whenever they say that, okay, we are the Pentecostal people and we are the this Pentecostal church and everything. But how much we are, trusting in the Lord and how much we are showing our spirituality and how much we are becoming an example for the people outside the church. That's an important question. You know, God says that I placed you in that, that place uh, to, the, to the eternal life church of God. God says that I placed you in Sacramento or in Folsom, okay, in this area, in this city. And God is asking that are you faithfully doing your works? Are you faithfully doing your work? You have a, I mean, I have a purpose about your church and you have to do it very faithfully. If you are not doing that, if you are not giving the light for the world, world, and God says that, amen, so I will come and I will remove that lampstand or that church from that place itself, from its place it is written there. And God will find some of other people to do that work. Let me tell you, if the born again churches, if the if the I mean uh, Protestant Christian churches are not worshiping God in a real way, God will find the other people, other nominal Christian, other people, other religious people to worship God in truth and spirit and with the Holy Spirit and everything. I mean, so God will take some people from outside. But this is our responsibility. Then let us trust in the Lord. Let us worship the Lord in a wonderful manner. You know, let us not be the worshippers of uh, the world. You know, Bible even Bible says, you know, most of the time we are the worshippers of the world. But we, the worshippers of the Spirit, that is the intention of God about the Christian church. We have to be the worshippers of the Spirit. Yeah, do not be the worshipper of the world. Okay, so it should not be a literal, I mean, uh, worship or something. Let us lead a spiritual, spirit, spirit-filled life. Let us lead a spirit-filled life. You know, I don't know how many of you are, I mean, I mean, having the spirit-filled life. You know, um, I don't know how many of you are, I mean, uh, getting, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, get up in the morning and praying, the Lord, I need that, I mean, spirit-filled life. I mean, you know, regular things are happening every day. No? Regular things are happening. You may be having a prayer, or you may be I mean, singing some songs, or you are attending for the church meeting and everything. That's okay. But how many of you are praying the Lord, oh Lord, I need a, a spirit to build a life in my life. So let us not uh, try to exhibit or show up our spiritual uh, life and uh, activities to others, but let us be yielded to the Holy Spirit of God and do everything for God's glory. Hallelujah. So we need to be yielded to the Holy Spirit and God's Holy Spirit will give us the guidance how to live, how to worship, how to pray. And then, so whenever we are getting the guidance from the Holy Spirit, we are supposed to be yielded unto the Lord and say, the Lord, I'm coming to your presence and I'm worshiping you 
worshiping you i mean i'm leading a, a holy life and i i can lead a i mean faithful life in this world hallelujah so that is the i mean third point i can give you from this portion now we will go to the fourth main point that is promise <clears throat> the promise which is given for the church at ephesus the promise which is given for the church at ephesus that is in chapter 2 verse 7 chapter 2 verse 7 it says like this he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to him who overcomes i will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of god okay so the promise and the reward for the church at ephesus is to him who overcomes i will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god men so god is giving the appreciation for the church and god is giving the i mean uh, warning second is the church and god is giving some of the solutions god is giving i mean pointing out some of the big points of the church and also at last god is giving the promise and the reward for that church you know especially the tree of life in the midst of the paradise it is written there the tree of life in the midst of the paradise okay you know the 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 the, the uh, mentioning that the paradise god's paradise it is written there god's paradise that is the heaven god's paradise which is mentioned here in this verse is the heaven the heaven uh, we will read uh, two verses from Luke chapter twenty three verse forty three. Then uh, after that, we will read a second Corinthians chapter twelve verses three and four. Luke chapter twenty three verse forty. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. To the criminal, uh, uh, Jesus said that word. Okay, second verse, second Corinthians chapter twelve verses three and four. and i know that this man was caught up into paradise whether in the body or out of the body i do not know god knows and he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter on behalf of this man i will boast but on my own behalf i will not boast except for my weakness okay so through these two verses or three verses we understand god's paradise it is mentioned here it is the heaven okay so to get the real meaning of this uh, promise or the reward we will have to uh, go to the book of genesis book of genesis there we read uh, uh, god planted a garden in eden okay god planted a garden in eden and he placed man in that garden he placed man in that garden you know uh, we have to think about the eden the word eden there are uh, three fold uh, uh, mainly three meanings are three meanings are there for the word eden the first one is delight and second one is place of much water and the third one is a uh, living place delight place of much water living place that is the meanings of the word eden word eden that is the garden of eden delight place of much water living place and again when you go through uh, chapter 2 uh, and 3 okay especially 3 that we don't you know uh, and there were uh, two trees in the middle of, of the garden two trees in the middle of the garden uh, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and god said to them you shall not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and if you eat you will surely die that's the commandment that god has given to the adam and eve okay you shall not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and if you eat you will surely die but there were two trees okay the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil okay and when you read genesis chapter 3 verse 24 there we read that the lord 
sent them out of the garden and appointed his angel i mean what is the cherubim or cherubim with the flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life okay so there is a there is a there is a boundary you know there is there is a there is an angel still you know cherubim the the, the angel cherubim is there uh, with a with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life that is in genesis chapter 3 verse 24 okay so uh, but uh, you know uh, it it is already guarded and uh, nobody can take that at the same time but the promise of heavenly fruit of the tree of life is offered for those who overcome that is very important you know that is forbidden for them but now this is open this promise is given about the fruit of the tree of life about the fruit of the tree of life that is offered for those people those who are overcoming something what to overcome what to overcome the overcoming the worldly pleasures of this world worldly pleasures overcoming the satanic temptations and overcoming the influences of the sin okay when a person is overcoming all these things worldly pleasures satanic temptations and influence of the sin god is promising god is offering this blessing and this reward that i will give you the tree of life the fruit of the tree of life hallelujah and the and the spiritual meanings of the fruit and the and the tree of life is mentioned here um is the is the is the eternal life through jesus christ and the continuous spiritual blessings that we receive forever and ever hallelujah so that is what we understand from john chapter 3 verse 16 and john chapter 10 verse 10 we will read only one one verse because john chapter 3 verse 16 is by heart and the other verse john chapter 10 verse 10 there our just name also is written john 10 10 somebody can read that verse john 10 10 the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy i have come that they may have life and have it to the full amen hallelujah so what is that men full of life that means eternal life okay so the the the, the, the fruit of the tree of life mentioned in uh, i mean uh, uh, chapter i mean uh, revelation chapter 2 verse i mean 7 uh, uh, it is actually i mean the meaning is uh, Uh, the, the 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 eternal life through Jesus Christ and also the continual I mean spiritual blessing that we are receiving I mean forever and ever Amen so remember one thing that in in chapter two verse seven God says to the church Amen specifically says that he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the church Okay so if you are having an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the church Okay, so the spirit of the Lord is not only saying to the Ephesian church, but the spirit of the Lord is saying and giving the advices for every church, every church. Okay, in all over the world. Hallelujah. So it says that otherwise God will remove the lampstand from its place. Otherwise God will remove the lampstand from its place. Hallelujah. You know, one thing you have to remember. when you when you go through this verse you know exactly that happened in the, in, in Ephesus okay god said if you are not keeping my commandment and if you are not i mean listening my word if you are not listening the word of the spirit then god will remove the lamp stand from its place that means god will remove that church from that place history says that exactly that happened in the city of ephesus by the end of a uh, fifth century by the end of the fifth century the city of ephesus was destroyed the city of ephesus was destroyed and there is no local church in that city at present there is no local church at present in the city of ephesus so let us be faithful and serve the lord faithfully till the day of his coming hallelujah so we may be we may be i mean saying that we are we are strong i mean and we are strict we are we are the strict person maybe doctrine wise okay so we may be having the enthusiasm for the for the ministry of god we may be giving the tithe and offering regularly 
Hallelujah. So maybe attending uh, every meetings of the church, but let us find out what is our weakness and fault and let us come back to the Lord. Hallelujah. So, I mean, I, I would like to, I mean, close this class, I mean, uh, with a word of prayer. Just before that, remember one thing, you know, let us come back to the, to the Lord and ask, I mean, examine ourselves. I mean, what is my fault? What is my fault? Maybe we are saying that because we are doing all those things. We are, we, I, I'm a strong person. I know the doctrines and I know the, I, I have the enthusiasm for the ministry of God. I'm sharing the gospel towards the people. I'm giving the tithe. I'm giving the offering. I'm attending for the every, every, every meetings regularly. Everything is fine. But let us just find out what is our weakness and what is our fault. And let us remember from where we are fallen. Just remember from where we are fallen. Let us repent from the present situation of mistakes and let us repeat the first work that we did in the initial stage. Amen. When we, when we met Jesus Christ, accepted him as a personal savior, amen, and the Lord, we had that enthusiasm. We had that love towards God when we met Jesus Christ and accepted Jesus as a personal savior. Do we have that same situation? Do we have that, have that same love, the first love, towards God and towards the brethren at present? Do we have that first love towards God and towards the co-brethren? Hallelujah. So let us examine ourselves and uh, let us commit ourselves with the mighty hand of God and uh, this, I mean, evening. And it's, it's a great privilege for every one of us to come together in the presence of God. And as we were listening from the word of God that, I mean, God is giving the appreciation for the efficient church. God is giving the promise for them. God is giving the, I mean, the, 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 the ever, I mean, pointing out the weakness of the persons and God is giving the I mean, and solution for the church and God is giving the promise and reward for the church of God. I mean, so this, this evening, let us all close our eyes in the presence of God. Let us look unto the Lord in prayer. I mean, so let us all, I mean, I mean, I mean, ask to the Lord, oh Lord, I'm coming to your presence and I need uh, your power. I need uh, the, the, the presence of the spirit. And I need the, 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 the guidance of the Holy Spirit to, to live in this world of God. Hallelujah. I mean, God will help every one of us to, I mean, overcome the temptations of this world. I mean, to overcome the, the, the satanic temptation, the worldly pressures, and the influence of the sin. And we will be, I mean, usefully, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, we will be the useful vessel in the sight of God. So let us all, I mean, I mean, give ourselves the mighty hand of God. Now I request that.